At the beginning, I would like to point to some questions imposed while thinking of the meaning articulated by the title of the research project Fast Forward Women in Photography, within which this conference, Women Photography Conflict, has been convened. These questions should, I believe, make clear why I didn't choose to talk about practices of certain women photographers who have been working or are still working in the countries affected by conflict, by, but instead to offer you my reading of one curatorial project, or better to say, say visual essay, articulated by exhibition entitled The Halberstadt and subtitled Michelle Searching for Mars. The first question is related to the syntagm fast forward, which is, in my understanding, used here as a metaphor aimed to claim urgency or proper public recognition of women photographers' agency, but it originates from technologies of reproduction of video records. There is a fast forward button built in any media player and is signified by symbol consisting of two mutually touching arrows pointing right but there is also a rewind button signified by arrow spotting left, which allows to watch again that what has already been seen. I would say to review what was given to be seen and more important to perceive that what was earlier overlooked. In her 2006 book, Dead 24 Times a Second, Stillness and the Moving Images, Laura Maui introduced introduces a concept of delayed cinema, <coughs> explaining with, with the possibility to return past through cinema. Such return facilitated, uh, was facilitated by the, I quote, kind of spectatorship that has developed with the, with the use of new technologies with the possibility of returning and repeating a specific film fragment, end of quote. It is important to notice that Malvi's argumentation echoes with Freud's concepts of death drive and Nachtredlichkeit, a term which is usually, usually translated in English as a deferred action. In September 2022, in Icona Photo Gallery in Venice, I saw exhibition The Halberstadt, Michelle Searching for Marx. It was curated by Jiva Kraus, Zagreb-born artist and gallerist, who in early 1970s, after graduation at the Academy of Fine Arts in Zagreb, moved to Venice. A few years ago, when I asked her why had she chosen Venice, she replied that she was being interested in all Europe and thought that its traces could be found in Paris and Venice. Paris, she told me, was too hectic for one who wanted to be con concentrated on her own research work. In 1979, Gio Kraus opened Icona Photo Gallery, one of the first galleries in Europe dedicated to promotion and research of photography. Not by chance, <coughs> her gallery has, was inaugurated with personal exhibition of Giselle Freund. <coughs> During the course of 1980s, she presented works of women photographers who are today, but not at that time, considered as classics of photography. Just to mention here Bernice Abbott, Lisette Model, Rosalind Solomon, or Helen Levitt, whose exhibitions were accompanied by the catalogues meticulously edited by Krauss herself. In the context of this research project name, Fast Forward, it's worth to recall, or better to say, to rewind here, that Naomi Rosenblum's seminal book, A History of Women Photographers, was first published in 1994, more than 10 years after Jiva Kraus began to trace the unwritten history of photography by her own curatorial practice. When talking about curatorial practices, it has to be recalled that a noun, curator, originates from a Latin word which is directly related to verb curare, that means to cure, to heal, or if we will, to care for someone who is wounded, 
or being exposed to wireless is in mortal danger. Here arises my next, next question <coughs> related to the title of this conference. Why do we use euphemism, a word conflict, to designate a state of war, a state which nowadays is not anymore the state of exception, but normalized state of affairs, new global economic <coughs> paradigm that can be best understood within Mbembe's concept of necropolitics? The next question that arises reads, how could women working in photography act in order to dismantle hegemonic discourses and pertaining epistemologies that endor endorse the necropolitical paradigm? And is it possible at all? I am fully aware that this question resounds with the question posed to Virginia Woolf at the dawn of the Second World War on which she responded with her 1938 book, Three Guineas. She, asked, she was asked by an unnamed, educated man how, in her opinion, war could be prevented. Considering that question unique in the history of human correspondence, because never before an educated man had asked a woman such a question, <laughs> Virginia Woolf wrote co comprehensive essay dissecting the conditions under which daughters of educated men were finally in the first decades of 20th century allowed to gain university education. The price was not to question the co competitive principles, social hierarchy, and the existing epistemological paradigms that were and still are evidently designed to support warfare. Wolf asks, I quote, need we collect more facts from history and biography to prove our statement that all attempts to influence the young against <coughs> war through the education they receive at the university must be abandoned. For do they not prove that education, the finest education in the world, does not teach people to hate force, but to use it? Do they not prove that education, far from teaching educated generosity and magnanimity, makes them, on the contrary, so anxious to keep their possessions, that grandeur and power of which the poet speaks, in their own hands, that they will use not force, but much subtle methods than force when, asked, when they are asked to share them. And are not force and possessiveness very closely connected to war? Of, of what use then is a university edu education in influencing people to prevent war? End of quote. My next question is related to the fact that political thinking, which manifests itself in questioning the existing hegemonic paradigms, has disappeared from the so-called high politics, public politics, including education, and became relocated in the area of the expanded definitions of art. But what for do we need world art? In 1936, Walter Benjamin, who, reconsidering the very concept of history, articulated the notion of dialectical image, published an essay entitled The Storyteller, where he stressed the unprecedented change that occurred during the First World War. He argues that the art of storytelling is coming to an end because it was replaced by new forms of communication, information. Every morning, he writes, bring us the news of the globe, and yet we are poor in noteworthy stories. This is because no event any longer comes to us without already being shot through with explanation. In other words, by now, almost nothing <coughs> that happens benefits storytelling. Almost everything benefits information." End of quote. Benjamin writes about embarrassment when the wish to hear a story is expressed and argues <coughs> that it is, I quote, as if something that seemed inalienable to us, the secrets of our possessions were taken from us, the ability to exchange experiences, end of quote. 
The photographic essay offered by, by Jiva Krause's exhibition, The Halberstadt, Michel Searching for Marx, insists on the agency of storytelling, which according to Benjamin's understanding considerably differs from novel, because the storyteller takes what she tells from experience her own or that reported by others, nameless storytellers. Experience, which is passed on from mouth to mouth, is the source from which all storytellers has drawn, concludes Benjamin. In her curatorial statement published at the end of the exhibition catalog, Jiva Krauss emphasized the silence of words which she wanted to translate, I quote, into the images of people whose lives intertwine under the common name <coughs> Halberstadt, allowing us to discover ourselves and ask who we are and who is the other, end of quote. She has encountered this silence of words in a book, <coughs> Born Somewhere, published, published in, 19, uh, in uh, 2021. The author of the book is French cinema producer and writer Michel Halberstadt. Krauss asked for her consent and cooperation in the procedure of composing the exhibition, which manifested itself as a kind of rhizomatic story, deprived of need for explanation. The exhibits one encounters at the gallery walls are photographs of different sorts and provenance, shot at different places for different purposes, in different periods ranging from the beginning of 20th century to the second decade of 21st. The exhibition takes the spectator or the listener of the silence to the field of multiple spatiality and te temporality, echoing the title of Michel Halberstadt's book, Born Somewhere. But who was born, and does that verb signify singular or plural, an individual or the multitude? The book, which is not a novel, neither autofiction, but rather a kind of travelogue, opens, opens with sentences. I am the last of Halberstadt. This name will, will die with me. <coughs> that what made her to conclude that her last name was mortal and to begin to trace its history was the photograph her father had shown her for the first time a few days before he died. It was a photograph of his mother, Michelle's grandmother, about whom the father never spoke. Michelle took a snapshot of that photograph that made, her, that made her start searching for the story of the name which is going to die with her. In these presentations, I put on the right side uh, captions with which were accompanied exhibited photos. So those are Michelle's words, not from the book, but, but made as a captions for the, for the exhibition. That search led her to the German city Halberstadt, where the family names come from. There she has photographed the remains of synagogue, Jewish memorial, and the yellow star exhibited in a museum. She also went to Polish village Wegro, where her father David was born in 1915 and lived until 1936 when he escaped to Palestine. The entire Jewish community, numbered approximately 8,000 people in 1939, was exterminated exterminated during the Second World War. There, Michel re-photographed the photograph documenting the destruction of the synagogue. The reflection of her hands holding camera is visible in the protection glass, and the appearance of colored reflection over the surface of the black and white photograph reveals a double temporality of the event of the image. She also recorded how today's cities, city of Wegro commemorates the demolition. And 
she offered for comparison two photographs of the Jewish cemetery, one archival, another taken by herself. Where is the next one? What have you done? <laughs> okay. During her search for the last name Halberstadt, she went to Treblinka, which is located one hour driving from Pegro, and took a photo of a floor tile from the gas chamber exhibited in a glass display case. The caption accompanying the photograph tells that her father's two sisters were killed there. Among the photographs, among the documents Michelle found during her research was the form of her parents' request for the French citizen, citizenship from 1950s on which their standardized pho photographs for documents were attached. Jiva Krauss included a snapshot of that document in the exhibition. It is like all Michelle's exhibited snapshots and archival documents she found and re-photographed accompanied by the caption written in the first person singular, a story. Following the traces of the family name Halberstadt, Michel discovered Hamburg photographer Max Halberstadt, who is the author of the best known photographic portrait, sorry, photographic portrait of Sigmund Freud. He was a husband of Freud's daughter, Sophie, who died in 1920 at the age of 26 from Spanish flu. Michelle took the photograph of her gravestone in Hamburg. As the spectator learns from the captions of one of Michelle's Halberstadt snapshots, Max Halberstadt fled from Hamburg to settle in Johannesburg <coughs> in the same 1936 when her father David escaped from Wegerow to Palestine. At the Halberstadt exhibition, Max's flight to Johannesburg is connoted only by Michelle's snapshot of his then 94 years old daughter Eva. <coughs> the figure of Eva is exactly that what outlines the temporal transversal articulating the concept of non-chronological time within which voices of the multiple of nameless storytellers, storytellers can be heard. For, at the walls of Icona photo gallery, the spectator is given to reflect on the period of one century, century of wars, destructions, persecutions, marked by two photographic portraits of the same person, as an old woman <coughs> and as a three years old child. I have to remind here that in 1936, when Eva's and Michelle's fathers were fleeing from Germany and Poland, Walter Benjamin, in his Paris exile, wrote The Storyteller, as well as the work of art in the age of technical reproducibility, at the beginning of which he stated, I quote, in what follows, the concepts which are introduced are completely useless for the purposes of fascism, end of quote. Sigmund Freud, whose photographic portraits in, the ex in this exhibition, for me signify the concept of concepts of death drive and trauma, fled from Vienna to London in 1938. Michelle Halberstadt didn't miss to take a snapshot of the place where he was thinking in the last year of his life. Jiva Krause's exhibition, The Halberstadt, Michelle Searching for Marx, in my opinion, visualizes the concept of dialectical image, which Benjamin defines as an occurrence of ball lighting that runs across the whole horizon of the past and the involuntary memory of the redeemed humanity. 
The narrative structure of the exhibition ignores the hierarchy between the so-called fine art photographic prints and the amateur snapshots. The difference in framing of the vintage prints of Max Halberstadt's photographs borrowed from Freud Museum in London and several private collections and the snapshots Michelle made during her research exist to emphasize double temporality of which Barth wrote while relating photography with death. Based on his analytic experience with the patients traumatized by the First World War, Freud in 1920 published the study Beyond the Pleasure Principle in which he elaborated a concept of the death drive. In the same text, he also calls it its drive of aggression and the drive of destruction. In my understanding, the exhibition to Halberstadt invites the spectators to rethink these concepts from today's perspective. Thank you.